Welcome to another episode of the Emetophobia Free Podcast. Today we are joined by the lovely Sam Marker, who is one of our Thrive Programme coaches over in the States. Hi, Sam. Hello, Michelle. How are you? I'm fabulous today. Thank you. How are you? Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Excited to talk. Fab. Me too. Today's topic that we're going to talk all about, and it's a topic close to our, both of our hearts, is mm -hmm. food and eating uh, around emetophobia. Well, let's start with your story because you are an ex-emetophobe yourself um, yeah. and you did struggle with eating as a result because so, not all emetophobes struggle with eating, but some yeah. do. So do you want to start at the very beginning, share your story, and then we'll take it from there? Sure. I can give you a condensed version because I was emetophobic for... 23 years, a little over. Um, that was, I mean, it touched every single part of my life. And my eating was really heavily impacted. I weighed about 85 pounds as a full grown adult woman, which I think we've talked before. I don't know what the conversion is, but it was, it was bad. <laughs> I was, I was very malnourished. Um, and as a child, even I, when I talked to my mom a little bit about this, she said, well, when you were in elementary school, we took you to the doctor because like, I could not gain weight. I just did not gain any weight. And they diagnosed me as a failure to thrive. So mm. it was literally like on the border of malnourishment because wow. I only eat like butter noodles, um, toast. There's these things here that are like these little sides. It's like a rice packet with some chicken flavoring. That was pretty much it. Saltines. Um, my diet was really, really limited. And in my diet being limited from phobia, my health was really negatively impacted yeah. as well. Yeah. So it, it had a very profound impact on my physical and mental state, the lack mm -hmm. of food. Um, but my phobia was so severe. I mean, I, I couldn't hold a job. I couldn't, I couldn't go out. Um, I didn't really go out to eat. And your life is just sort of reduced to trying to be okay. Yes. Because you have to eat to live. Mm -hmm. And eating is the enemy whenever you're phobic and thinking in those types of ways. So like you have to eat to stay alive, but you're terrified to eat. And so it's just the cycle of yes. constant anxiety. And that's where I was for, yeah, it was a little over 23 years okay. before I was able to get over it. Okay. So if we talk specifics then, because mm -hmm. people watching this may be a metaphobic themselves. So totally mm -hmm. get where, you, where you're coming from. Um, some people may be watching this as a loved one of someone with a metaphobia, mm -hmm. maybe a parent um, mm -hmm. who has a child similar to yourself who's struggling to eat and struggling to gain weight. What did it look like on a day-to-day -day basis almost? You're saying, you know, I would, sit, I would eat just these things. You had a restricted diet, yeah. if you will. Mm -hmm. What did it look like for you in terms of what were those thoughts? If you can recall that far back, because I know you've been a metaphobia you're free now for seven years. What were the uh -huh. thoughts that were driving that yeah. for you? A lot of it was that this is dangerous. Mm -hmm. So anything that I put in my stomach could potentially come back up. Mm -hmm. Everything. So it was very much like viewing food, which is a necessity. And now what I spend most of my money on, I love, yeah. I love getting to eat. So it's so crazy to think about, but I mean, this food was just this threat. Yeah. It was just, I eat this. There is the potential that it could make me sick. Yeah. And if it doesn't make me sick, then I could get sick and then I'll end up throwing it back up. Yeah. And everything was just, oh, you know, just something to be approached with caution and yes. only eat what I had to eat. Yes. It was never what I wanted to eat or mm -hmm. until I was full. It was just, just eat enough. Yes. Um, there was lots of snacking, like Cheez-Its <laughs> and animal crackers and anything that was really bland just to keep a hungry feeling away. Because yeah. I was like, well, I don't want to be so hungry that I'm sick, but I also can't be full. Yes. So it was lots of looking at food as a danger more than anything yeah. else. Okay. Lots of kind of contempt around food. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So when you obviously went through the Thrive program, had mm -hmm. you tried anything before? Because obviously if you'd been malnourished, was, was there anything yes. before the Thrive program? Yeah, I tried everything before the Thrive program. I okay. And actually, funny you asked that because food was a big catalyst in me doing the Thrive program. Okay. So 
Um, prior to the Thrive Program, I did CBT, uh, just mm-hmm. cognitive behavioral therapy here in the States. I did NLP, mm-hmm. which is neurolinguistics programming. Um, I had done rounds of EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. It's that's specifically for PTSD. And my doctor at the time thought I had a traumatic experience with emetophobia or with vomiting, therefore developed emetophobia, and that would help. It did not. Um, mm-hmm. I did hypnotherapy as well. Okay. And... The catalyst for me finding the Thrive Program was my husband came down with food poisoning one Mm. evening. And I couldn't be sure that it was food poisoning. How do I know he doesn't have the stomach flu? Of course. So I I said, good luck. I wish you the best. I left and I went to my parents. I just was leaving him there by himself. You know, have fun. And I get to my parents. It's 1130 at night. And my dad pops his head out and says, nobody drink out of the orange juice. I've been throwing up. And I was like, oh, no. Oh, it's everywhere. There's nothing I can do. So I chose to go back to my house because that was my safe place. I at least knew that it had been cleaned. And then following this incident, I, you know, I did my usual safety seeking behaviors. I stayed up till the sun came up. I took all of the antiemics that I possibly could get a hold of. Um, And for the next, this was the big thing for the next 10 to 14 days, since I could not be sure that it wasn't the stomach flu, I only ate a cliff bar, which is a granola bar, um, morning and night for two weeks. That was it. That was the entirety of my food intake. Um, And I was like, I can't, this is not sustainable. Hmm. So I found an exposure therapy program here on the East Coast in the U.S., Because that was the only treatment center nearby that even knew what emetophobia was. And I was trying to hype myself up to do it because I didn't, I did not want to do that. (laughs) No emetophobe wants to do exposure therapy. Um, And I was like, you know, I have to, I like, I have to change my life. I can't just exist like this. And I was looking for reviews on this exposure therapy program. Okay. And I found Mary's testimonial instead. Uh, Little Mary. And we all know Mary. We did. And I watched, I'll get very emotional thinking about this. I watched her testimonial and she said, I just didn't think I'd have a moment of peace before I died. Yes. And I was like, oh my God. Yes. Yes. That's it. That's exactly how I feel. And so I said, well, you know, I don't want to do this exposure therapy program. I may as well try this. This is a sixth of the cost. Mm -hmm. It is shorter, you know, whatever. Let's, let's just try it. And that was eight years ago. And I've been better in coaching for seven. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. So, needless to say. Yeah. The, yes. That's right. Yeah. But it was really that moment of like, I've, I've actually only eaten granola bars for yeah. two weeks. Yeah. Like I can't, this is yes. not sustainable. <laughs> yes. This yeah. is not a way to live. Yes. So, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So journey through the program then. So you found Mary. Mm-hmm. Fabulous yes. Mary. Found Mary Wonderful. and then started the program. Did you do it with a coach? Mm-hmm. Did you do it by yourself? I did it with a coach. Okay. I um, had a coach who I believe has since retired, a wonderful little Scottish man that I just adored. He was great. Um, <laughs> he took me through it. I actually ended up taking myself through it a second time um, after I worked with a coach because, and I think you'll probably relate to this, I started feeling a lot better. And Mm -hmm. I kind of slacked off in my effort and my practicing my skills. And I created a ton of anxiety a few weeks after I got really kind of down on myself, talked to the coach, gave me a pep talk. And I was like, okay, I'm getting back in this. And I took myself through it a second time. So I've done it on my own and with a coach. And I, I had to have a coach, I think the first time, because I really needed somebody to give me that perspective. And he was just lovely with that. It was such a good experience. And you come out of that, I think, even though I wasn't fully cured, like I wasn't where I am now, you come yeah. out of it with this very clear picture of like, oh, okay, this is what I need to do. Yes. Like this, this is what I need to keep doing in order to be okay. Absolutely. And it's just this very like hopeful feeling of like, all right, I can see, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel now. Like I see how I get out of this and it's the best, the best yeah, feeling. Amazing. amazing. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about what drives this around food. Mm -hmm. And then we can talk about those people out there who are either suffering themselves Mm -hmm. and struggling to eat, or they have loved ones who are struggling to eat, how they can help them overcome that. And 
ironically, it's not by challenging themselves to eat new foods. Okay, right. <laughs> certainly not in the in it. the first instance at all. So you have to take into account, you know, when you have a metaphobia, you have a certain set of limiting beliefs, and you have a certain set of thinking styles which created the metaphobia in the first place, and is then working to maintain it. So. Ultimately, even though this podcast is all around food, um, and I will share parts of my story that I don't think I've shared before around food in a moment, it's important to understand that that isn't focusing on food and what food you are eating as a, as a barometer of success and a barometer of getting better isn't the most helpful thing to do. So yeah. looking at food and how it impacts you know, emetophobes is important so people don't feel alone and you don't feel like you're on your own with this if you're struggling to eat. Um, and you know, potentially I, I came off, I'm going slightly off here, but I came off a call this morning with a lady who her stepdaughter, um, had a metaphobia, but didn't realize she had a metaphobia. She just thought it was something wrong with her, her stomach. Cause she felt sick all the time. And yeah. that was my experience as well. I, I didn't know it was a metaphobia. I hadn't heard of it. Didn't know it was a thing. I just mm -hmm. thought I feel sick all the time. I've got these IBS symptoms. There's something physically wrong with me. So I went for all the tests and put on all sorts of diets, FODMAP diets and things like this. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, when you are struggling to eat, it's very easy for other people to associate it or attribute it, should I say, to more well-known uh, mental health symptoms like anorexia, like bulimia, mm -hmm. for example. Was that your experience or was it very clear yeah. to you why you were restricting your food? I knew I had anxiety and it wasn't so much clear like, oh, I'm afraid I'm going to throw up just yeah. so that. I more so realized that I was nervous all the time. Like I was always yeah. anxious and I'm just having a panic attack. Yes. So, but the doctors that I saw, it was always like ARFID, um, yep. which is avoidant food restricted or avoidant food avoidant intake. Avoidant, avoidant restricted food. Disorder. <laughs> yeah. My gosh, I knew I would get there eventually. <laughs> one of um, those. <laughs> one of those. It's a combination of that. So it's that or anorexia. And I had to explain yeah. to them, like, it's not it's not a dysmorphia thing. Like, it's yeah. not that I think I'm fat. It's that I can't yeah. eat. Yes. Like, it's not that yes. I'm looking at myself and picking myself apart. Yeah. So I think the ARFID was definitely more accurate because yeah. there was lots of restrictive food. Mm -hmm. There was lots of avoidance. Um, so that really fit in. But that was more of what they would pinpoint was an eating yeah. disorder yes. more so than the emetophobia. And so when you try to treat an eating disorder – because that's what's well known and that's what seems obvious, but you miss the limiting beliefs, mm -hmm. you miss the emetophobia, the yeah. eating disorder does not improve because Absolutely. that's the part of it. And I, that Absolutely. was one of the things that was missed a lot with my doctors. Yes. Luckily, my mom knew I wasn't anorexic. Like she yeah. knew that it wasn't that kind of issue. So she was yes. seeking mental help, mental health help. Um, but yeah, with the doctors, it was always pinpointing something more known like yeah. ARFID or anorexia every time yes. Or, yes. Um, looking for like ulcers or any sort yep. of like issues with my esophagus. Cause I would yep. always like say I had chest pain and nausea. So yep. we went down that entire route before we really found a name for it. And yes. I think finding the name and going, Oh, Oh, mm -hmm. it's not just me. Yeah. Was, it was like a light bulb. And you finally have a way to kind of like attack it and know how to make yeah. changes once you know absolutely. what you're fighting against. Yeah, absolutely. I remember the day I found the word emetophobia and it was a, as a, I was doing CBT, but online uh, mm -hmm. through the NHS because we have the NHS in, in England and there was a lady on the other end of that. I've never saw her, never met her, <laughs> but the CBT therapist. And she said, oh, I've been researching what you've been describing. And, you know, I've came, come up with this research paper about emetophobia. And it was literally like it had been a research paper had been written about me. And I cried yeah. instantly because I was like, yes. ah. <laughs> they were talking about carrying gum with you and drinking water. And uh -huh. like, this is me. And I remember going to my dad and saying, dad, there's other people like me. And he mm -hmm. vividly remembers. He sort of said, I remember you being in tears and, and over yeah. the moon because you weren't the only person. And obviously it's so hard for people who are watching you restrict your food because you feel yeah. helpless, you feel powerless, but yeah. the people around you are also in that boat because they don't know how to help either. Yeah. Yeah, do you, very much so. I, no, go ahead. I was going to say, do you want to, how, do, what's your experience of that? Do you want to share that? Yeah, I definitely limited doing things 
where food would be involved. Yes. So in talking to my family, uh, my mom was like, well, you, you don't, might not remember this, but like, you wouldn't go on vacation with us. Mm-hmm. And I had totally forgotten about it, but I was 16, 17 and they were going to Florida to Disney. Yeah. Um, they went every year and I was like, nope, I'm not going because I'm just going to have to make attacks the whole time. Yes. Like yes. we're going to have to be shuttled to the resort. Mm-hmm. So from the resort to the park, we took a shuttle. So I couldn't leave when I wanted. I'd have to wait on a shuttle. There would be none of my safe foods there. Mm-hmm. I would have to buy food that had been prepared by somebody else. And that wasn't yep. going to happen. Yep. Um, I mean, I avoided three or four vacations. I just did not go with my family because of the potential of having to eat food that was not my safe food being out. And I just knew I was going to panic the whole time. Absolutely. Um, and my sister and I, there's a pretty big gap. And when I was kind of chatting with her about it, she's like, I missed so much with you. Mm-hmm. And I, I didn't realize that. Like, I just mm-hmm. wouldn't go to dinner. I wouldn't go on vacation. I wouldn't go out. I I, mm-hmm. I stayed home mm-hmm. because of the threat of having to be out and creating anxiety and, and food. Um, my husband and I the countless dates when we first started out that we would like start to go out to eat to a restaurant. I'd be like, I can't do this. Like, yeah. We need to turn around. And he was the, he is the most patient human in the world. He is the best partner you could possibly ask for. And I adore him. And I was yeah. like, so what's, what's so much better now? He's like, we try new places all the time. Like that's our thing is like, we enjoy going to try new restaurants for his birthday. We met friends in DC and our whole weekend was food centered. Like nice. we went and had high tea and then we had yeah. this wonderful meal at an Egyptian restaurant and I had a half a chicken Ooh. the size of my head. It was so <laughs> good. <laughs> and there was zero anxiety. And he was like, yeah. eight years ago, that's, that's not an experience yeah. yes. that you would have had. Yeah. So like I missed so much of living yes. because of avoiding panicking. Yes. You really do. You really yeah, do. And it impacts yeah. people around you and you don't realize it. They they worry for you. Oh, you know, very much so. Yeah. It, yeah. It's shocking to see somebody you love only eating enough to like keep them alive. Yeah. Yeah. It's very difficult. It is very difficult, but it's also one of those things as well that it's not a helpful thought to be dwelling on or brooding about that you're impacting other people because all that's going to do is put pressure no, on yourself. No. It's not, Absolutely. it's not helpful. It, you're not doing it intentionally. It's not something that you're mm. set it, you know, getting, getting up in the morning. Do you know what I'm going to yeah. do today? I'm going to worry my loved ones. That's what I'm going to do today. Yeah. <laughs> that's not, that's no. not the goal. You're just no. surviving, aren't you? And just getting through, Absolutely. getting day through day to day. Yeah. They just look at you and they're like, I just want them to be okay. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. They just like yeah. look at you with love. Yes. And then when yeah. you do get better, nobody celebrates with you more than yeah. those people Absolutely. who watched you yes. be sick. It's awesome. Absolutely. Like yes, they still absolutely. get excited over things. I've been better for so long. Yeah. <laughs> I visited my family and we had dinner and my dad's my dad just looked at me, got all misty eyed. He's like, I just love seeing you have an empty plate. That's lovely. It's like, I've I've been so good for so long. But yeah, they just yeah. they get so excited to see any progress and any yes. improvement. Yes. And they love through all of it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And the social anxiety side of things, you know. Yeah. I don't know where that features in your story, but it was certainly part of mine that I hid it for so long. Mm -hmm. Um, And I would pretend to eat things and hide food so it looked like I'd eaten Mm -hmm. things um, and tell people that I'd eaten when I hadn't. And I I would do Mm -hmm. all of that business because there was such a shame. I felt such a, I created such a sense of shame for myself that I thought, well, I can't say that I'm not eating because I don't want to worry my loved ones. I don't want them to ask the questions because ultimately yeah. I know this is irrational. I know I should mm-hmm. be eating. I know it's not healthy what I'm doing here because I was, I don't know the conversion, but I was, you know, seven stone. I don't know what that meant. <laughs> I don't know how it relates, yeah. but either way, very, very underweight. I knew it wasn't healthy and I didn't want to be doing mm-hmm. it, but equally having my loved ones worry for me wasn't going to help because it wasn't going to solve the situation. Yeah. It only adds more pressure. So it was one of those beating myself up for it and not just acknowledging Mm -hmm. that they would just celebrate with me and they did just want me to be happy because I was giving myself such a hard time for not eating and I was Mm -hmm. beating myself up for such Mm -hmm. a lot for not eating that I presumed that other people would think really badly of me and get really mad with me and really stressed and 
And it was something that I didn't feel that I could handle at that moment because my self-esteem was so low and I felt so powerless. I was like, I'm just going to avoid that situation Mm -hmm. (laughs) because I don't think I can handle it, which is, it's not a very nice place to be in. Um, No. (laughs) But it's, it's great that, you know, you can be quite extreme, you know, and with what you eat and what you don't eat and come out the other side. So if, if, you know, when people are listening to this, my, if they take nothing else away from it, I want the message to be, no matter how extreme you are with your eating or not eating, mm-hmm. you can still overcome this thing. It's still predictable. Absolutely. It's still effective. You know, you can eat yeah. granola bars and only granola bars for two weeks and, and come out the other <laughs> side of this, right? You can be seven stone or however yes. many kilograms you were. You can mm-hmm. do it. So, yeah. yeah, brilliant. All right. I wonder if we can talk about black and white thinking in terms of food, because this is what I see a lot with mm-hmm. my clients. Um, yeah. When the focus is is possibly unhelpful and the focus is still on food, mm-hmm. because what tends to happen is, loved ones particularly, is they see the food as the main problem because mm-hmm. that's what you're stopping, that's what you're not eating, and therefore they feel that that is the main thing. Yes. And therefore, that's just like, well, are you eating more? Have you eaten today? Are you doing this? So the focus is food. Now, the problem with the focus being food is that it adds pressure. The person with the metaphobia adds pressure onto themselves to eat, and therefore, they're more unlikely to eat, which isn't helpful. So I want to talk about black and white thinking in that when people with a metaphobia have a plate of food or something that they've made, it's a black and white thing. It's generally, I can eat that or I can't. That's safe or it's not, okay? I can Mm -hmm. try it or I can't. And it's not, you know, just try a little bit of it because the black and white thinking won't allow them to do that. It's a straight no or yes. Is that your Mm -hmm. experience? Do you see this with clients around black and white thinking and food? Absolutely. It's it's like a very strict rule. Like I can't, I can't. I absolutely Mm -hmm. can't eat that. Mm -hmm. I could never. Mm -hmm. And in talking with clients too, and like kind of sharing stories during that, that first session, the consultation, they'll be like, Oh, I could never like, if I share, Oh, I couldn't do that. And there's no thought in their mind that they possibly could. could. It's And when you start to change the way that you were thinking. And for me, one of the biggest things was just identifying that initial thought. Yeah. That that was really one of the biggest things to like help yes. kind of keep me calm. And once yes. you lower that anxiety, it just feels like, oh, okay, maybe, maybe that's not true. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I could try it. It, it comes yeah. in a very gradual experience, yes. but the black and white thinking is one of, I think the biggest factors in food that mm-hmm. and catastrophic thinking it's either so, this is super safe and this is fine and I can eat it or I absolutely yeah. can't or it's I can't eat this and this will make me sick every time yes I can't, yes. I can't touch this yes. there were so many foods that you would think would have been on my safe food list that were not because yep. for some reason my brain said no no that's not just I can't eat that that's gonna make me sick yeah like I, I can't touch that food yeah and when you start working on that black and white thinking in other areas, in every mm-hmm. area, mm-hmm. it carries over to you eating. Yes. And that's one of my favorite parts about the program is you don't have to look just at all of these specific emetophobic symptoms. Right. If you change the underlying thinking, if you yeah. notice when you're thinking black and white about other things in your life, about relationships, about mm-hmm. events, about things you can and cannot do, that all carries over and suddenly you're looking at a plate of food and you're like, you know what? Maybe I could. Yeah. Maybe, yes. maybe I can. Yeah. Why not? And it's, it's a brilliant moment to have. Yes. It's wonderful. It is. it is. Yeah. And that leads us nicely into the conversation around, well, how did you start eating? Right. Because mm-hmm. it's one of those things. If, if we're saying both as coaches, right. Don't focus on it. Don't let food mm-hmm. be your primary focus. Mm-hmm. Yes, you know, it's a long-term goal. You want to be eating. But actually, your thinking needs to be your focus in yes. all areas. Thriving needs to be your focus mm-hmm. in all areas. When you're thriving, the food will come. So how did that look for you? Yeah. And we, we talked a little bit about this earlier, and I was kind of thinking, like, I was trying to think of the specific moment where I sat down. I was like, I'm going to eat I can this eat. food. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And I, I realized I never had that. Mm-hmm. It was simply that I started feeling better 
I started having less anxiety. I started paying attention to my catastrophic thinking because my thinking was very black and white, but primarily for food for me was very catastrophic. Yes, It was very much looking at it as like this big threat that it simply wasn't. It was just Mm -hmm. a piece of chicken. It was not. (laughs) <laughs> the bread, yes. like it felt. Um, yeah. So whenever yeah. I was able to like manage that catastrophic thinking and really just feel like I was capable of handling things as they happened and feeling yes. generally more calm, it kind of happened really organically, mm-hmm. the eating. Like mm-hmm. one day I was just eating and oh, I finished my food. Yeah. And I didn't freak out about it. I had just finished my food. Yeah. I wasn't worried that I ate too much. I wasn't worried that I was overly full. And then because I kept on with my positives, that positive yes. listening, processing the positives, which if you were going through the program and listening to this, process your positives, yes. please. Yeah. <laughs> because the benefit of answering those three questions about your positives is yes. absolutely unmatched. So when absolutely. I had the experience of sitting there and finishing this meal and I could go, mm-hmm. This was a positive because I never would have done this before I would have been worrying. Mm-hmm. If somebody else had done this, I would be so stinking proud of them. And mm-hmm. this shows me that like I can just sit and eat and enjoy a meal yeah. and not yeah. create tremendous amounts of anxiety over it. Mm-hmm. And when you have those experiences and you process them, it's so much easier to have another experience like it. Yes. yes. And eventually you're eating and yes. trying food and mm-hmm tasting things that you never would have considered before and it just sort of happens in that way because you are paying attention to your thinking and you are thriving and you are just reducing your general anxiety it just Mm -hmm. all it all works together in the same way that metaphobia and regular anxiety can compound and snowball reducing the anxiety can reduce the metaphobia it can reduce everything and it just absolutely it's wonderful to see happen that way. It's so exciting to like talk about how I used to be because I'm so used to how I am now around food. Yeah. And I eat three meals a day and snack (laughs) in between and often (laughs) snack at night. And like my husband and I, when we have like little weekends away, we go to this place in DC because of the food. Food. There's like 200 different restaurants and we park and we walk and I walk in the heat, you know, after eating and I don't think of it. Whereas before that's what my whole life was centered around. So it's, it's so just unbelievably overwhelming and exciting to remember what that was like and see who it is now and know that like, this is, this is possible for anybody who wants to do it. I Mm -hmm. think that's the biggest thing. Some people think, well, like I, I have ARFID. I have these diagnoses. I cannot eat. Like I can't do it. You, you absolutely can learn how to, I yes. know it doesn't feel like that, but I cannot mm-hmm. stress that enough. This yep. is a possibility for anybody who wants it for their lives. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it takes effort and it takes determination, mm-hmm. But the effort that we're referring to here is not sitting down and forcing yourself to sit through panic, to sit through anxiety and eat something. That's not the effort that we're asking for here. We are asking for the effort to manage your thoughts. So what am I thinking in this situation? Is it helpful? Is it not? The food is a byproduct almost. So Mm -hmm. shift that focus. I remember as you were talking about the, uh, the restaurants there and I was thinking about my own story. And I remember a couple of moments Um, one of which was my friend, she reminded of me, reminded me of it the other day. We live, I live in, in England and in the North of England and we're just surrounded by farms. So there's a certain times of the year, the tractors come and they just spread fertilizer across everything. And it, stinks to high heaven (laughs) if you've got your windows open it just smells all day because there's just fertilizer um (laughs) and she came round to my house and it was right at the height of the emetophobia and our oven chips were on my safe food list Uh, and everybody that's another point every emetophobe safe food list is slightly different Uh there are some common but that it's all slightly different because it's just based on a belief system which is a a flawed limiting belief Mm -hmm. system but oven chips were on my safe food list and because I put them in, we then started chatting. Because the smell was outside, she said, I remember you thinking, saying to me, oh, I'm not going to be able to eat those because what if the fertilizer smell has got onto the chips and I threw all the chips away? Now, I'd completely forgotten about that. And I was like, did I? <laughs> she was like, yes, and I was quite looking forward to chips. I didn't even <laughs> ask her if she 
<laughs> didn't even ask her if she wanted any chips. I just threw them away. Because <laughs> in my mind, it was, it was well, no one's going to want to eat chips if there's fertilizer around because it was such a normal way for me yeah. to think. <laughs> Bless her. I, I know, but it, it sounds, uh, you know, strange now to think that that would even be a thing. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just so it shows the power of your beliefs. And you articulated yeah. it beautifully earlier in that, you know, focusing on the tip of the iceberg being the food that you are taking in or not is only going to chip away at the tip of the iceberg. That's just your safety seeking avoidance. What's going on below it is where the focus needs to be, and that's your limiting belief. So Absolutely. I needed to really work on the fact that a smell can't make you ill and doesn't smells don't attach to food. And mm -hmm. it, I had to really work on all those limiting beliefs that I had in those areas yeah. to be able to feel calm enough to then eat when they're spreading yeah. muck around the fields, which they do quite a lot. So, it, you know, it took some, some getting used to and my own journey through it when you say you know you described not being able to remember the day you sat down and thought right I can eat something similar with myself but I do distinctly remember taking the pressure off myself really working on my perfectionist thinking really working on my social anxiety and saying mm -hmm. yes to going to a restaurant with some friends instead of avoiding it I said yes and I took the pressure off myself to eat anything so I said I'm going to go mm -hmm. I'm going to tolerate the fact that I might not eat anything here. And mm -hmm. I'm going to tolerate, you know, the fact that these people are my friends. They like me. They, if I don't eat anything, they've seen it before. They've seen me not eat things before. This is fine. I right. can cope. And because I took all of the pressure off myself and my focus was to enjoy the evening and be in the presence of my friends and just to enjoy being there, I was able to eat. And I got to, I was eating my food that I'd ordered. I was thinking, I'm eating this and I'm not anxious. And I remember that like elated feeling I, I created because yeah. I was like, whoa, this is actually happening. And it was because I wasn't focusing on it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't my focus exactly. to go and eat. My focus was to enjoy the evening. If mm -hmm. I ate, I ate. And if I didn't, I didn't. And I ate because that was the focus and I wasn't putting that pressure on myself. Yeah. So really important that I can't stress enough that it's not a barometer of how well you're doing, whether you're eating something or not. Your experience in that moment, how calm you feel yes. mentally, mm -hmm. that should be your focus. That should be your barometer. If you're feeling calmer, yeah. less panic, less worried, then you know that you're getting yourself there. The food will yeah. come if you're feeling calm. And that's the mark, I think, of, at least for me, that was the mark of being over the emetophobia was that mm -hmm. I was able to live my life. Yes. Like yes. I could experience things. I was yeah. at dinner. And again, like you said, whether I eat or not, mm -hmm. I'm still at dinner and I'm mm -hmm. sitting there talking mm -hmm. to my family, talking mm -hmm. to my friends, and I'm remembering the situation. Like it's not just that I was sitting there anxiety riddled trying yeah. to keep myself calm and now I haven't paid attention to anything that's going on. Like I started being able to make memories with the people mm -hmm. I love doing things I wanted to do. Yeah. And that is, that's the best part of this is like yes. getting to just live your life and have good experiences. Yes. And then once you can't eat, the food is phenomenal. Like yeah. nobody <laughs> yes. appreciates food the way that somebody does when you <laughs> used to restrict it. Like it's, I, I would crave cheeseburgers, like, mm. which is such an odd craving because I don't even eat red meat, but I would crave a cheeseburger when I was a metaphobic and like, I would get one and I would get a bite in and I'd look at the meat and I'd be like, nope, mm -mm, yep. can't do this. Cannot yep. do this. And now I'll crave a cheeseburger. And again, I don't eat red meat. So there are definitely digestive repercussions <laughs> the next day. <laughs> but now I'll just be like, no, we're getting that cheeseburger. And I will yeah. eat it happily every bite. Yes. And it's just like, this is so great. And the only reason that that is possible is exactly what we've been talking about. Mm. Because I have like this belief that I can just handle Like if I have digestive yeah. issues the next day, I can, it's fine. Handle it. I can handle it. I can be yeah. calm. I, I can just do these things. And because yes. you have this unshakable belief in your ability to handle things. Yes. And you haven't let any of those, like, I, I feel like it's, for me, it was a lot of implicit thinking, like thinking I didn't even realize was necessarily happening yeah. around eating and around being around people. When you notice those and you change mm -hmm. them and they're gone and you can just... Yeah enjoy it it there's yeah. there's nothing better and it it all really truly does come down to being able to manage that thinking 
and the Absolutely. anxiety can create. Yes. Everything yes. else will come. It just does. Yes. That's yes. the biggest thing. Yes. And it's a, a skill set. It's something yes. that's an active thing. You know, we're both talking mm-hmm. from the other side of the fence here and yeah. people on the side of the fence of I'm still suffering with thing, this thing might think, well, you know, it sounds wonderful. It sounds pie in the sky. Mm-hmm. It sounds like a magic, a magic thing that it's just going to, I'm going to be able to eat. It's no magic about it. Yeah. It's a skill set. It's something that you need to one, understand how your mind works and then mm-hmm. two, put in effort to change your thoughts yes. and to challenge yeah. your beliefs. It takes mm-hmm. effort. It takes consistency. It takes determination but ultimately, all of that effort and consistency and determination pays off because you are Absolutely. getting yourself over this thing. It's not something yeah. that's done to you. It's not, you know, when you first hear about the program, you're thinking, well, what is it? Is it, you know, something that I've got to challenge myself and push myself outside my comfort zone all mm-hmm. the time? And no, not all the time. No, you don't. You've, you need to manage your thinking first. It's something that you yeah. are in the control of. You're in the driver's seat. You're the one taking yourself through it at your own pace. A coach will also go at your own pace. A coach doesn't set your challenges either. Yep. You're the one all the time setting the challenges for yourself mm-hmm. when you feel you're ready. And I think that's a very important point when you're talking about something as delicate as food. Yes. Because ultimately, if you're putting massive amounts of pressure on yourself to eat, then it's making sure that your, your focus shifts to eat what you can eat, you know, mm-hmm. keep yourself alive, eat, you say, foods. Don't put pressure on yourself to eat things because you feel like you should eat them. Just eat what you can. Mm-hmm. But all the while, be putting effort into managing your thoughts, managing your thinking, getting that skill set, getting the thriving skill set under your belt so that you can change your thoughts and then the eating will come. Yeah. And I love that you say it as a skill set because that's, that's how I explain it to my clients. Mm-hmm. And I always give them the example of riding a bike. Because when we first learn to ride a bike, you have the training wheels, you have the helmet, you're nervous about it because what if I fall? This is going to be really scary. And it takes time to learn how to do it. You have somebody else showing you and then eventually you're trying by yourself and then you take the training wheels off and you might have a wobble there. And I mean, maybe you can wreck the bike and you get back up and you do it again. Until eventually, like you've ridden this bike so many times, you don't even think about how you start off. You just take off, get going and you're gone. Yes. And it's it's very much the same thing. The more you practice the skills that you learn in the program, mm-hmm. the easier they are to employ, Absolutely. the more automatically they come out. Because yes. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of effort for the first few years for, for me. Like I really had to like kind of check the way that I was thinking and yeah. continuously and, and just really pay attention and be mindful of that to where now it's like if if I just have one of those thoughts um, like my husband, and I made a great bolognese this fall and I was eating and my brain went, that'd be gross to throw this up. And I kind of went, what? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I was like, that's, that's a, anything would be gross to throw up. And then I just yeah. finished eating. Like it was nothing, yeah. but it's, it's to the point now that a thought that would have caused me to spiral. If I hear it, I don't have to fix it. I'm just like, well, that's, that's not a thought. Right. Let's, yeah. let's, let's just move on. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and it's nothing, but it takes yeah. time to get there. It takes practice it and consistency. Yes, like any other skill, the more you do it, the more yeah. you practice it, the yeah. better you are at it, the easier it is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Fabulous. Lovely. So the, the focus of this podcast has been all about food, but in general, yeah. obviously you're working beautifully with clients now, taking clients through the program. Do you have any tips advice words of wisdom things that you would like to say to people listening to this podcast um who are struggling with their food anything that you'd like to share this is the best thing that you could do for yourself Mm -hmm. truly Mm -hmm. my life would not look like this had i not been looking for reviews on an exposure therapy program and came across mary and listened to her story and gave this a try I had literally tried everything and this has changed my life and I watch it change people's lives all the time. And I say, watch it change people's lives. I watch them take this information and change their lives. I watch them put, put in the effort consistently just work and say, I want to be different and Mm -hmm. become different and hit their goals. This is easily the best thing that you can do for yourself. And Mm -hmm. while you're going through the program, One thing that I always tell my clients is you're not responsible for that first thought, but the second thought and the first action. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And that helps me so much identify and identifying unhelpful thinking because mm-hmm. a lot of times thoughts pop in out of habit and then you're like, oh, that's not, that's not right at all. And when you go, okay, let's make it helpful. That's okay. the second thought. And what's the yeah. first action? The first yes. action is either distracting yourself or moving forward or pushing yourself. It could be different depending yeah. on the thing. But knowing that even if you have a thought, it's not the end of it. It doesn't mean that you're doing something wrong. You can have the yeah. thought, but what's important is addressing it, changing it and challenging it. Yeah. And I think as you're going through the program, that's like the most helpful tip in learning how to manage your thinking is Brilliant. first thought, second thought, first action. Yeah. And just try, just, just give it a try. You, you Nothing to lose at all, everything to gain. It's wildly effective and it's such a joy to get to coach and see people changing their lives and getting their lives back. It's, this is the best job in the world. Yeah, <laughs> I, will, I will tell people that. Oh, easily yeah. the best job in the world. Um, Cause you get to sit and talk to people who have never met another metaphor before. Mm-hmm. They, that people yeah. mostly have never even heard of it. Mm-hmm. And to just see the, the drastic changes that people get to make over time, sometimes quickly, sometimes over a year. Yeah. And it's, it's never, there's never a timeline that you have to follow. I think that's mm-hmm. another important thing. So many people are like, well, I have eight weeks. No, no, my dear, yeah. you have eight weeks to learn this. Yeah. You have the rest of the rest your life, of your to, life. <laughs> yes. to apply yes. this and, and don't give it up. Keep yeah. working. On it. Yes. Don't put yourself on a time frame. There is no yeah. timeline. It's, yes. it's the amount of effort and consistency that you put in. And as long as you do that, changes absolutely will come. Absolutely. Absolutely. Brilliant. Lovely. Lovely words of wisdom. Love that. So I completely agree with you. There is no timeline. And I think the the final thing that I will say is, you know, you're, you're applying it. You've got the rest of your life and it's a doing thing. It's an active process. Yes. And it becomes really easy to do, <laughs> to be an exometophobe yes. and to live life without a metaphobia. But you still have to make the conscious decision to thrive every day and to go, I am going to apply these skills today. If I have yeah. to consciously do it and put the effort in, even seven years afterwards, I'll do it. But that's very it. rare. Mm-hmm. It's very rare that that happens because it's your new yeah. normal. You're so used to riding that bike fluently. That doesn't mean every now and again, you're not going to hit a rob and have a wobble. But you just got to put yeah. the effort in to get yourself straight again and then off you go. It's a skill set. It's not something happening to you and it's an active mm-hmm. thing. So it's, it's making the decision that, do you know what? This is in my power to change my life yes. and keeping the, the attitude that no matter what happens, no matter how long this takes me, whether it's eight weeks, eight months, eight years, I'm going to get over this thing. Then ultimately Absolutely. you'll get there because it's predictable. Mm-hmm. It is very much so. Perfect. Thank you, Sam. It's been a pleasure. It's been a real, real pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. What a fabulous topic to talk about. I hope it's been helpful for people out there. Um, And yeah, thank you. It's been great. Thank you so much. It was so good talking to you, Michelle.